Welcome to this week's episode of the Read Well Podcast. My name is Eddie Hood, and I'm your host, where I believe it's more important to read well than to be well-read. So grab your favorite book, open up your notes, and let's get ready to learn something fascinating. Hey, readers, welcome back to the Read Well Podcast. My name is Eddie Hood, and I'm very excited today because we have a special guest on the show. I'm always happy when we have guests because it makes the conversation dynamic, and we're, as always, talking about how to read well. The mantra here is to read slowly, take notes, and apply the ideas. And today, I would like to introduce you all to Dr. Martin Jacobson. He is an associate professor of English at West Texas A&M. He mainly focuses his time on teaching linguistics and several other classes around composition and literature and what have you. And my hope today was to talk to him about some unique strategies that you may not have heard of when it comes to reading well, because he's got some really nice perspectives here. So Dr. Jacobson, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. How are you, Eddie? Good. Good, good. Thank you for taking time. He's been very generous with his time today, everybody, because he's he's just got done teaching a, a class. And my wife is a professor, so I know how busy they are. So, Dr. Jacobson, can you help us understand, first of all, linguistics is that's the course you just got done teaching today, correct? Oh, well, no, I taught a writing class today, but the bulk of my load is linguistics. Okay, perfect. So, Linguistics, I think we all understand what, what writing means, but many of us might not know the term linguistics. So can we can we start there? Like, what is that? Okay. Well, the way I present it to my introductory class is that it's the scientific study of language. We break it down into its components. I like to use the word properties. It's a little bit like the chemistry of language, I guess you could say. I generally break it into four methodologies. Phonology, morphology, syntax, and semantics. Phonology is what it sounds like. What are the basic sounds? How are the syllables built? Those kinds of questions. Morphology is word form. So back in school, when you learned about prefixes and suffixes and root words and all those kinds of things, that's morphology. So syntax is his word order in English. Now, it's got different meanings in different languages because not every language makes a sentence in the same way. There are lots of different kinds of languages, but English is a word order language, what we call an analytic language. And basically, the relationships between the words is governed by the order in which the words are given. Other languages link words together in different ways through inflectional morphology or polysynthetic languages actually just glue morphemes together. I'm kind of getting a little technical in my discourse here. And then semantics is like, what does a word mean? If you look it up in the dictionary, that's a semantic analysis that you'll find. History of the word, the changes in the word over time, where the word comes from. The, the etymology yes, of it. Yes, exactly. Okay. So if I were to take a course in linguistics or just to consider that on my own, that's that's a lot of sort of technical breakdown of how we speak, right? And as a reader, how, how does that help somebody as a reader appreciate or learn more from a book? Well, I think that one of the things that good readers have is an intuition for the way that syntax works and the way that words work. And I think readers who are, are struggling or who are starting to read again or something like that might have to build that back up. And I, I think one of the problems is the way that we talk about reading and writing in school, because we tend to talk about words. We're always saying it's the words. Did you use the right word? Did you word that correctly? That very sentence is disturbing to me, because if, if you say, did you word that correctly, really what you're asking is, did you write the proper sentence? And that's a different question. A sentence is a different question from a word. So when we think about that, and maybe when we write, we're a little more conscious of the fact that we are putting words together, but an active reader will think about word orders during the process of reading. If a writer puts something in a different order or an unusual order, there's usually a reason for that. They're trying to make a point of some sort of trying to plant a seed or something of that nature. And we have a lot of 
in English, we have a lot of distinctly syntactic elements. So what that means, what does that mean? It means that word orders are how we do things in English. So good writers will often manipulate word order in interesting ways. And I just finished a book by Shirley Jackson, where there's a very crucial moment in the story, and it's worded differently than almost everything else in the book. And because we need to pay attention to this, this particular place, a physical place. You think she's, she's saying, hey, reader, pay attention to this specific sentence. I've worded it. I really need you to hear this one. Yeah, the way that it worked in this particular order, and it happens quite a bit, it's called periodic sentence, is that the point of the sentence is at the end of the sentence, which generally in English, we start with the subject and then the sentence talks about what the subject is doing, if you will. When we have to wait for that part of the sentence, the writer wants us to sort of be led toward the, the thematic point or the particular moment in the story or what have you. The subject comes at the end of the sentence. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I actually like this. I just got done reading a book myself. It's called 4,000 Weeks Time Management for Mortals, which is this interesting book about time management, but it's not sort of the, the task uh, systems you might expect from a productivity book. It's a philosophy book about how you should think about time. But anyway, I bring that up because Oliver Berkman, he has a very interesting way of using syntax and it kept throwing me off first. I, I kept like tripping on his writing style. But then once I realized he was doing it, it became uh, more insightful and I was able to get more out of the book. He, he's using hyphens. He uses hyphens way more than most people do, but he's doing it every time there's sort of this parenthetical phrase in there. Right. So instead of putting them in parentheses or what have you, he's first statement, hyphen, statement, hyphen, statement, right? And it happens a lot. But once I figured that out, it was clear that he was really trying to highlight the bits within the hyphen so that I would pay attention to those sections. It's interesting, too, because using a hyphen actually brackets it more than a comma would. It does. It makes it stand out. Right. If you put it in parentheses, then we sort of think of it as being outside the text rather than something that's being emphasized. But those dashes or hyphens... That's that's an interesting trick. We call that graphology and linguistics, the study of punctuation and script and that kind of thing. We call that graphology. I, I never thought about that, but I guess you're right. When I see something in a parentheses, my brain almost says, I mean, if you want to read this bit, you can, but it's not necessary, right? You can glaze over this part a little bit because the author's just throwing it in there as a, as a side. And that's not the case, but that's what it feels like, right. you know? Maybe right. it is the case. Maybe the author means that. But yeah, the hyphens feel like it's still in the sentence. So, okay, that's an interesting idea. So linguistics then is this sort of scientific approach to breaking down a sentence. And as readers, we want to have some grasp of that because if we're with a really good writer, then they are being purposeful with their message. And they're using not only word choice, but the structure of the sentences to create extra meaning. And if we're paying attention, we'll get more out of it. Yeah. So we had this really great conversation. For everybody that's listening, I got a chance to talk to Dr. Jacobson before this. And you mentioned that you have a, a personal practice that you do that really, when you find a sentence that grips you, that's like, oh, this one's, this is different. This is a unique sentence. You have a, a personal practice of diagramming that sentence. That's correct. Yes. Which sounds like something that only an English teacher would do. I think that's right. So I don't know that any anybody listening will be going, oh, I'm going to start diagramming sentences, but I would love to talk about what that means and why you do that, because you sent me a, a picture of, of a sentence you diagrammed from Shakespeare's Richard III. It was fascinating. It was, for all of you, I, I don't have a visual of it right now, but it's, it's like this big spider web of words that you've connected and, and thought through. So what, what, what does it mean to diagram a sentence and why do you do that? There are uh, several mechanisms for diagramming a sentence. It's not just one thing, but I think the system that most people use or may have seen in school at some time when I was in school, you know, way back after Middle English had just gone out of favor, everybody diagrammed sentences in school. And the point of it was to understand how a sentence worked. And if you could do that, then you could write a more effective sentence. Well, that has to work the other way. 
if you can diagram a sentence, then you can understand a sentence that you're looking at as well as, you know, have a leg up on writing a better sentence. So when I run into an interesting sentence in a work of literature, something that's, you know, clearly above and beyond the typical writing, I like to diagram it because it gives me this understanding of what the author's getting at in a way that just reading it for the words, right? There's that that magic word again, won't give me. And, and one of the things that we also do, I think, very badly in school and so on, is that we don't understand the difference between phrases and clauses and those kinds of things. Punctuation is like, it's part of the system and we look at it and we kind of take it for granted. But what it's really doing is it's signaling the syntactic construction of a sentence. That's what punctuation is supposed to do. So in English, basically, a sentence is a subject and a predicate. And here's an interesting factoid for you. I continue to be fascinated by this fact, even after all these years. There are only 10 sentence patterns in English. Really? Yeah, that the basic pattern for a sentence, there are only 10. In the whole language, uh, we're talking 2 billion people who speak English and there are about there are 10 patterns and a pattern a sentence pattern is what we might call a deep structure so every sentence has a frame or a formula if you like that governs the relationship between its parts the sentence patterns are based on on those properties so sometimes we can get more than one outcome for any given deep structure we call that a deep structure okay but the 10 sentence patterns every sentence. And if we use other constructions like gerunds or infinitives or participles, they also conform to those patterns. So we're, we're using the logic over again. We, we do reinvent the wheel actually. And an interesting thing about it is that we even sort of learn that first, that we learn how the language works before we actually start putting words into it. So Well, first of all, that feels like a a very limited toolbox, which is hilarious because of all of the wonderful literature that's been written. But it also makes me think about some authors that manage to write these sentences that are are hundreds of words long sometimes. Uh, It makes me think of like Hemingway with all of these run-on statements or like Noam Chomsky or something that's just like, what what is happening right now, you know? So... Do their sentences also fall within one of these? Yes. Really? They don't make sense unless you have a system that you can make sense of. So if there were no limits, then a sentence wouldn't work at all. So mm-hmm. the fact that we have 10 sentence patterns, but again, we can embed those in different parts of the sentence. We can substitute, say, a direct object. We can substitute a word with a clause of some kinds, which will also have one of the 10 sentence patterns underneath it. So mm. we reuse them and they recur and we embed them in different ways like that. And that's kind of an interesting thing to think about, too, that, you know, you can have a sentence, as it were, built from clauses, not just out of words. So when we think of a sentence, I think, and again, this is sort of a, don't know what word to use here, an assumption that we, that we get from school. It's a subject, a verb, and an object. Well, we think of that as a noun, a verb, and a noun. But it can be a noun clause, a verb phrase, and an infinitive. It can be a gerund phrase, a verb phrase, and a noun clause. There are all these different kinds of constructions that we can use. And in big grammar, I call it, which is the the next level up, we just relabel it. We think of it as a new, that it's doing something, not that it means something necessarily. So this is this is where the paradox comes in is that when someone uses a phrase where you might normally use a word, that's a big choice that an author makes. And and you're getting something else when you get an infinitive phrase or a gerund or a noun clause than you would be if you just got a noun, a verb, and a noun. Okay. I I was actually thinking while you were talking about this, I mean, music, there's only seven notes in music, right? But what, how, how, how differentiated or how diverse is, is our musical landscape? And so maybe 10 sentence forms is not that limited. When I teach this particular part of the introduction to linguistics, I use the piano as the example. Because there are 88 keys on a piano. 
but you can play any song on a piano. There's really nothing that you can't play on a piano, but you only have these 88 notes. And it's what we call a discrete combinatorial system, a musical scale, an alphabet, phrase structure rule. If it's too big, it doesn't work. But we can recombine things within this system because it works the same way every time. And then we get these different outcomes for it. So here's another little factoid. We, by the time we're adults, really have a relatively fixed vocabulary. And I want you to think about your own experience here. We may learn a word here or there, but in typical conversations, we pretty much use the same words over and over and over again. We don't really use new words very much. But virtually every sentence you make is brand new and you've never used it before. You've never uttered it before. You've never even thought of it before. But you can instantaneously formulate a sentence with the same vocabulary you've always had and and articulate a completely new idea. And that's one of the things that happens in writing, too. And good authors are really good at, you know, putting a little surprise in there with the the word order or with the choice of, of linguistic form or something of that nature. And as you say in your uh, approach, you got to slow down a little bit to see some of that. If you read too fast, you can miss that part of what an author is trying to accomplish with a different construction or a different word order or a little out of the ordinary you know, phrase or something like that. This makes me think of George Orwell. So George Orwell, the essayist and, and novelist and, and what have you, wrote, I, I believe it's like 10 tips on being a better writer. I can't remember. But anyway, one of the tips is if you can use a shorter word than the longer word, you should use the shorter word essentially, right? I believe I'm attributing that correctly. But when you read Orwell, you're not you're not confronted with all of this sort of flowery language. You're not confronted with like having to have a dictionary and look up every other word. Like, what is he talking? He uses very short, succinct, like common words, but how he puts them together and builds his sentences. He's one of the greatest writers ever. Yeah, you know, I agree. Ever. I agree. Yeah. And I love Orwell. Like I just, I, he's one of my favorites. So, okay. So, so when we're diagramming a sentence, you're going through and you're, you're applying sort of your knowledge of these 10 different structures. And, and what do you do? Do you, do you first of all, start off by saying which structure is it? And then yes. breaking it down from there. Okay. Determining the sentence pattern is the first duty. Okay. It might sound daunting, but there are only 10 options, right? Now, sometimes, again, sometimes the same set of words can have more than one meaning depending on the pattern that you're using for it. I'll give you an example. This is one that I use in my class. I'm doing okay. a little Harry Potter yeah. quoting here. Let's do it. It's not a, a Harry Potter quote exactly, but it's it's based on the character, inspired by the characters of Harry Potter. I feel like I need to get my Harry Potter wand off the wall. I have a Harry Potter wand behind me. Well, and we're going to use the wand here because this is kind of magical what we're talking about. Let's take this sentence. Dumbledore made Snape a sandwich. Now, if we use a type 8 pattern, a type 8 pattern is what we call a ditransitive sentence. It's got a direct and an indirect object. Okay, so Dumbledore made Snape a sandwich. It means that he made a sandwich and he gave it to Snape. But if we put a type 10 pattern under there and we say Dumbledore made Snape a sandwich, Sandwich becomes what we call an object complement, which modifies the direct object. And in that sentence, it means that Dumbledore turned Snape into a sandwich. Yeah, now, the okay. word he and the word it. order yeah. is exactly the same, but the grammar underneath it gives you a completely different meaning, which, of course, that would be explained by context. And there would be other reasons why the sentence would make sense in the particular context. But the, gram- the outcome, the surface structure, what we call the surface structure of the sentence is the same in both instances, but the pattern you put under that structure gives it, the, gives it its meaning. So that's fascinating. So b- based off of these structures, we go from somebody creating a, an article of food and giving it to somebody to somebody turning you into an article right. of food. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, which is which is hilarious. And so, what a, what a good example. And when you when you stop to think about how hard it is to be a, a good writer, right? Because because sometimes you can write. If you've ever tried to write something, it makes sense in your head, right? You know what you're trying to say, but that's not always what comes out. And people will read your work and they'll go, "Why did he turn him into a sandwich? What are you talking about?" Yeah, exactly you know? right. That's exactly yeah, right. Yeah, it's a, it's a really weird thing. And so I, I think one of my 
one of my certain passions is absolutely trying to figure out how to clarify my own ideas. That's why I'm going back to school to get a degree in philosophy with a minor in English from uh, professors like yourself is because I've learned that I'm now 43, that it is incredibly hard to be articulate and get your thoughts together in a, in a, in a reasonable way. But I think reading helps with that. And I like what you said earlier about how as readers, you you build up a sensitivity to these language patterns. The more you read, the better you get at hearing the syntax and the structure and seeing a deeper meaning. I want to dwell on that for just a minute because a lot of people that come to the Read Well podcast will message me and they'll say, hey, I'm trying to get back into reading, but I'm really distracted. I'm having a hard time. Like I want to look at my phone and I can't stick with the book. I can never finish books. I think the message there is that it does get easier and you do get better at it. And eventually you will be finishing books and you'll be enjoying them. But you've got to give yourself some grace because you you have been without the reading brain for X number of years because you've been working on a career, you've been on the internet, you've been distracted by life. It is a, you have to reprogram some things up here, right? And not to the extent where you need to be diagramming sentences. Like that's something that that people like you and I would enjoy doing. Most people just want to be better readers. The message is just give yourself time, just stick with it. When my seniors come into my advanced grammar class, which advanced grammar is like diagramming sentences for 14 weeks. That's that's the whole semester is that. And and from that, my motive, I tell them, is to sharpen their grammatical intuition. That if you want to know what to do, look it up in a handbook. We've got handbooks everywhere. You can Google anything. I mean, if you want to find an answer to something like, where do I put the quotation marks? You can look that up in a handbook. But understanding grammar kind of from a gut level, just where you so you respond to a sentence because of what it does, not necessarily because of what the words in it mean, right? The meaning of the words that constitute the sentence. That's an intuitive thing. And really, in a way, what it is, is kind of like, I'm just, I'm working on this in the graduate course I'm I'm teaching right now. And it's kind of a big thought that we've been having, but there's this notion of gist that, and, and you said it earlier yourself, sometimes you'll be in the middle of a sentence and you just know that it's not what you mean to say. Now, how do you know that? If language was just a bunch of words strung together, you wouldn't really know that you weren't saying what you meant. So there is a what you meant somewhere in your consciousness and you package it in language and then you share it with somebody else. So that's one of those interesting things. And I think at some level, you know, there's a grammatical element in that gist, in that notion of gist. And it happens a lot with people who go between languages. I mean, if you learn something in English, let's say, and then you you know somebody else who speaks a second, a different language from English, and you want to tell them what you learned in English, you just can't, you can't speak to them in English because they don't understand language. So you have to repackage that thought in another language. So there's a whole, you know, we call it mental ease in linguistics. And it's kind of a, a language of thought or a formulation of the thoughts. And then you package that in language. So language is a, a way to share what you think, what you know, what you mean. And but the, it's an interesting thing. I started the semester off with that idea is, how do you know you don't know what you mean? I mean, if language is a bunch of words, you should never be confused. But the fact is, as, as we've kind of uncovered during our conversation just now, you don't always know. You want to say things more correctly or more, you know, convincingly or or whatever the case may be. And you can't just depend on words to do that work. There is, you know, something that you're trying to say, and it is distinct from a bunch of words. So that that was the way we started this graduate course I'm teaching this semester in. It's one of those moments where everybody has this experience that, no, I didn't mean to say that. I wasn't saying what I meant. We even have corrective little phrases for it, like, wait a minute, I didn't mean that, or let me rephrase. See what we say there? It's not let me reword it, let me rephrase it. That That's important. That That's a little hint that we do have a syntactic intuition for things that we say. I think the best metaphor I've heard of this kind of thought is about around baking a cake and the idea that 
certain steps and ingredients go into baking a great chocolate cake, right? You need the flour and the eggs and the chocolate. You have to set the oven to 375 or whatever, I don't bake. But you, you, you follow all these steps to the right order. And when you put it in, if you've done your job, it comes out as a chocolate cake. But if you, if you change the, sy the syntactical order of that process at all, if you don't put the eggs in, for example, you do everything else, but you don't put the eggs in, when it comes out, it's gonna look weird. And then you crack the eggs on top. Let's say it's still all the same thing, but it's not. You often say things that you don't mean. This is why I think we get messed up in email and written communication, because sometimes we can't hear our voice. I found when I write something, I have to read it out loud and go, that's not what I meant. Right. I have to hear it, right? But I, I think when we just type send, text send, all sorts of meaning and emotional baggage comes out. So this is this is a fascinating thing. If we bring this back to being better readers, I, I would argue too that not only is it about, did I say what I want to say, because this is from the writer's perspective, but when you're a reader, you can read something and go, am I reading this the correct way, right? Yes. Because there's, there's, there's two sides. Because when you read a book, if you're doing it while you're having a conversation with the author, and sometimes authors like Miss Jackson will we'll send you a meaning and convey it. And if you're reading very quickly, you're never asking the question, am I getting the appropriate context here? What's, what's your thought on that? Well, I, I mean, I do think that sometimes in the act of reading, we'll shift to autopilot and we'll just sort of be going from one sentence to the next sentence. And you can look up five pages later and wonder what happened because, you know, if you're distracted by something else or, or what have you, you get a little bit, you become automatic in, in deciphering it. I do think sometimes that reading a sentence aloud that's troubling to you does clarify what that sentence means. And in terms of slowing down, that's one of those things you can do to slow down is if you feel like you're not quite getting what you're reading, just start reading it out loud. Yeah, I've, I've actually done an episode on that because my my passion is philosophy, which is this amalgamation of just like random intangible ideas sometimes, right? And philosophy can be quite hard to understand. And if I sit in a room quietly and read it, even if I read it slowly, it's not, it's not entering my brain. Right. Right. So I will, I will read it out loud. And then for whatever reason, it like, it starts to fit into place. If I read slowly out loud, it just starts to work. So that's a great I think. So there's a book I have on my shelf. So many of you might have heard of it. It's called Infinite Jest by the writer David Foster Wallace. So whether you like DFW or not, or whether you read this book, it's a it's a mammoth book. And and Wallace is often seen as somebody who's somewhat difficult to read because he is putting all sorts of context into his writing, right? But the way he wrote Infinite Jest, it's about a, it's essentially about a, a, a tennis club. And, and American entertainment and addiction, and everything. But the setting is around this tennis club that's next to sort of a rehab center or re a rehabilitation center for drug addicts. Anyway, the way he wrote this is there are hundreds, thousands of footnotes at the back of the book, which is not something you would typically find in a fictional work. Right. Right. But there are just tons of them. And the way I've heard this described is, and whether this is true or not, I don't know, but I think it is. Wallace wanted you to have a conversation with him in this book. He wanted you to think and not just read the story. He wanted you to think about the deeper meaning. So he wanted you to be reading. And then every time you came across a footnote to go back and forth, like a tennis match, right? The ball's right. going back and forth. Right. And you're having this conversation and he's, you're going from story to author and sources, to story to author and sources. And it's meant to be a, a proactive experience. And the whole point of that is for you as a reader to say, do I understand what the author is saying? Right? Am I getting the message? That's another way to sort of think about another tip. Don't skip the footnotes. Sometimes, sometimes the footnotes are, are there for a reason. You know, they're valuable. I, I think of footnotes as a kind of hypertext, as a kind of rudimentary hypertext that yeah, you get sure. that link and you go to the another, to another source and you look at it. It's kind of like clicking a link on a web page. And this is, what I did my doctoral work on was how web pages function and how they're different from reading. Actually, how my premise at the time was that print literacy was bad preparation for computer literacy, that the rules just weren't the same, and that if you came into it from a, 
I'm a really good book reader perspective, you might have a lot of trouble. And this was in the early days of hypertext, you know, back in the mid 90s, when people were just starting to have internet access at home. And, and, you know, it was, I remember that like, sometimes the, the file days. Fail and, you know, there were all these sort yeah. of disruptions and, and roadblocks. And, and essentially what I did in my doctoral work was formulate a explanation for what a hypertext environment really was and how I extended it from literacy. Like for instance, when you read a book, it's an individual sort of internal mental process. But when you encounter a web page, it's kind of a virtual process and you're not in charge of everything that happens in a hypertext environment. Whereas I mean, if you're reading a book at some level, you're in charge of it. But when you're in a hypertext environment, you are not, and you might end up around the bend and not even know how you On got cat videos, there, right? Yeah, but in a cat book, videos, you, can't, you can't do that. I mean, we're really kind of led by the, by the uh, eye, we'll say. There's another book. I recommend this to you. It's called The Hermit of 69th Street. It's by a postmodern novelist named Jerzy Kaczynski. I don't know if you've ever heard of Jerzy Kaczynski, but it's the same thing. He's got a bunch of footnotes and he's trying to show the absurdity of documenting every word because he was accused of plagiarism. And this was kind of his response to the accusation was, OK, here's what happens when I prove it all. And of course, there are way more footnotes than text, and it's that game. He's playing a game on that. I don't know if you're familiar with the book or the movie Being There. No. That's Jerzy Kaczynski. He, that was his moment of fame. It was a movie with Peter Sellers. Oh, Pink Panther, Peter Sellers. I recommend the movie Being There. It's a really, it's a really good movie. Anyway, that idea of you know substantiating what you say, I mean we like it until we have to do it kind of. And then, you know, when you get lost in the confirmation, you forget what you're doing. And, and there are these sort of interesting moments for, we're getting a little, I'm getting a little off track about that. No, but it's an interesting conversation because I think at the end of the day, a book is communicating a message. And if you want to be a good reader, you need to understand that it's not just about in, uh, entertainment. I mean, there are books that are written solely for entertainment, but the kind of books that I suggest we spend the majority of our time on are books that will add some sort of edification to your life, right? Beyond just entertainment. And those kinds of books require a real conversation. They require taking time. They require thinking. They require, I have found, I benefit greatly if I am reading something that I know is going to be challenging to go to experts first. So, you know, if I'm going to read Richard III, for example, I'm going to, I would like to read other people's papers on it or whatever before I just read Shakespeare, because you know, it's definitely a, a process and I want to get the whole picture of it. But I, I think this is all valuable because the, the more proficient you get at speaking English, the, the, the better you are at not only understanding people, but also having better relationships. You're going to be happier in life. And it's the same for reading. You're, you're going to, you're going to get more from your books. So it's not going to hurt us to learn a little bit about the English language. You know, it'll only help right. us. Yeah. Oh, in fact, I don't know if you've heard of this book, Benjamin Dreyer, Dreyer's English. Have you seen this one before? No, I don't think I know it. No. This is this, this is a fantastic book for people that don't know anything about English, but want a really sort of easy t uh, approach to sort of getting your head wrapped around grammar and sentence structure and what have you. Dreyer is just this amazing guy. He he's worked as a publisher and an editor. I can't remember his whole background, but it's it's very very good. And let's see here. He was the oh vice president, executive managing editor, and copy chief of Random House. So he's got some some weight behind him, you know. But this is a this is a fun book to have. English or grammar overwhelms you, which I think for many of us it can, you know. But you want to improve a little bit. So well, that's that's fantastic. So I think that the, we're getting close to sort of wrapping up here, and I wanted to just end by saying if you were somebody that was trying to come back into reading after having spent X number of years, like we mentioned before, focused on career or, you know, you're, you're really used to like swiping on the phone and you haven't been in a book for a while and you want to rebuild that habit. You want to retrain the reading brain. What, what are your, what are your thoughts on, on how to start doing that in the year 2024? I think I would start with some slow rabbits. I think I would start with some shorter books that would be, you know, you could build rebuild, let's call it, the way that you 
conceptualize the overall meaning of a book. If you start out with a thousand page book, you're going to get lost in the trees and miss the forest. I think, you know, starting with a book that's a couple hundred pages long, it, it's not only easier to get through, but I think that you see the global elements of, of reading it rather than just the one sentence by once. Because if you're coming back into it brand new, you might have, as we mentioned here, that little bit of autopilot where, oh, there's the period, there's the capital, that's the next sentence. See, when you get past that basal level, and I think that might be easier if you're reading something that you can conceptualize as a whole thing relatively readily, and then you can move on to a longer work later. But I think maybe even starting with novellas or short stories might be a good place to sort of train your mind for keeping a story going in your mind. Yeah. Because that's where yeah. it all happens is in your mind. So, yeah, I. I, I've got to ask then if, and I want to make a comment while you're thinking about this, because I don't want to put you too much on the spot, but can you think of one or two shorter books that you have found interesting that might not, might be a good place for people to start in, in any category for entertainment from Stephen King all the way up to Plato, right? But what are what, what would you say is one or two shorter books that you have found fascinating? And maybe while you're thinking of that, I think the value in starting with something shorter is that you'll complete the book. Yes. And yes. I think it's so important that you finish it because we, we're so used to not finishing things now, being pulled in a thousand directions, even at work. Like I can't, I've got this big project I'm working on, but now my boss has given me another project. So this one kind of dies away. And there's just this constant sense of incompletion. And it feels so good to say, I read this book. And, you know, when I, I had to retrain my brain to get back into reading, and I actually read a collection of short stories by Stephen King, which just it was wonderful for me because I, I enjoy that sort of suspenseful fiction. They were short, and I was able to sort of just feel that sense of accomplishment, you know. But I've had some people say, what should I start with first? And they, they came across one of my videos about why I love The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. And I'm like, don't start there. That's a very big book and it will take months to read well, you know. But if you're if you're a proficient reader, it's a, it's a fantastic book. I just read a Stephen King book actually called Elevation. Oh. And it's good Stephen King, but it's not... Because Stephen King can be kind of a chore sometimes. And he he's so funny, but you don't know he's being funny sometimes. And, and he's there's a lot of darkness in Stephen King, and sometimes he goes a little over the top. This book doesn't do any of that. It's a relatively recent book, 2018, I think. Nice. It's a couple hundred pages. Again, it's 150 pages, I think. It's almost a novella, really, more than a novel. But everything's pretty easy to follow, and even though it's otherworldly like his work tends to be, you don't have any trouble getting to that next world. You don't have to work very hard for it. That'd be a good place to start. I also recently read O oh Pioneers by Willa Cather, and I really liked it. It's not very long, but I'm from Nebraska. And actually, the house I grew up in was built the same year O oh Pioneers was published. And I had a real sort of nostalgic response to that book. And so if if somebody's just getting back into reading, they might want to read a book that's set in the place they're from, or that that might incorporate some kinds of things that are familiar to them already, so that they could then not work as hard at deciphering that from the descriptions in the book. But there were sentences in O Pioneers that just, well, that's the way I say that. That's the way people there say that. And it was a really interesting moment to kind of see things that were very familiar to me written about in a book and it made the book a little bit easier to to go with so you might start you know another place you could do if you're if you're new you're restarting your reading career is start at where you live don't try to read again the brothers karmatsov is a, a hard read because you're just not ready for that i recently read notes from the underground by dostoevsky and it's a monster, even though it's only 100 pages or so. It's a monstrous, it's a monstrous read. And it's not the kind of place you'd want to start, even though it's not very long. So front load the familiarity a little bit with these first few works, and then you can branch out into something that's less familiar. That's a fantastic way to sort of wrap up our show is to consider that uh, to get back into reading, 
you should address the ego you have as a reader because I think we think, okay, I want to get back into reading. So then we go to the, our local bookstore and we go to the classic section because we think, well, these are probably the best books. Now we're staring down, you know, Moby Dick. We're staring down Crime and Punishment or something because these are the, the classics. But you're likely not quite ready for that yet. Right. Your brain is going to like veer in, in three paragraphs and then you're going to set it down and be like, the Brothers Karamazov is terrible. <laughs> but if you read it in a year, you might think otherwise. And so, yeah, this is a, this is a good tip, everybody. Take a moment for your first couple books to pick something, as Dr. Jacobson suggests, maybe 300 pages or less that is more for entertainment than maybe learning at first, that is is somewhat personal falls in line with some of your interests so that you can enjoy it. And you can say, I read a book. It's been 25 years since I read a book, but I did it. I'm back in the game. And that's where we want you to be. This is a, this is a, a muscle getting, learning how to refocus and how to be patient. You know, I, I just wrote a poster yesterday about how reading is a, is a solitary activity done in silence. We, for whatever reason, have become calibrated to not enjoy silence. We like we like the idea of silence, but once we get it, we kind of get a little twitchy. Like, I need, like, I got to play with my phone or I got to have something happening. And so once you kind of reprogram yourself, you will get better at this. And yes. Um, yes. and uh, you will start to enjoy books again. You'll, re you'll re regroup that. Well, Dr. Jacobson, it has been a pleasure speaking with you. It's so much fun to speak to people who love reading. It's great, this little community that exists. And I, I wonder if there's any last thoughts you, you would like to get across before we wrap up for today. Just that, as you, I, as you said a minute ago, you can't bench press 300 pounds in your first trip to the gym, and you can't read Crime and Punishment for your first book back. You know, you need to have a little easier at bat. That first at bat needs to be a little bit, a little bit, you know, underhand pitch maybe. And again, I think there is a success model. If if you get one done, then you can go on to the next one. But if you shoot too high and miss, then you just don't get back to it. I think it becomes overwhelming. And so, and, and as you say, I think you've got, you're really onto something. Slow down. And if it's complicated, slow down again. And that's right. Read it out loud. I really think that's a, a sort of you're getting more than one sense of what you're doing. And that's important, I think. So, yeah, I love it. Well, hey, uh, I, I've started a new practice with guests on the show. I don't know if you've noticed, but I've, I've been uh, enjoying my beverage from this nice little mug that I've got here. This is the Readwell mug. It says, read slowly, take notes, apply the ideas on the, the little mug here. I'd like to send you one of these as a thank you just for being a guest on the show. Yeah, sure, so, sure. That'd be great. That'd be, that'd be nice to, to shoot that over. So hang out for just a sec when we're done and I'll get your contact information. But I want to thank all of you as well for watching and listening to the podcast this week. Uh, I'm going to be working very hard to get more excellent guests like Dr. Jacobson on the show to help us be better, more thoughtful readers. There's so much that goes into building this skill. But most importantly, you should be following your curiosity so that you enjoy the process. Reading should not feel like work. It should be something you're doing because it makes you feel joy. And with that, as always, read slowly, take notes, and apply the ideas. And I'll see you all next week. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to take your reading to the next level, then head on over to thereadwellpodcast.com. There you'll find daily posts on how to read well. You'll also get access to all of my book notes and tools for becoming a better reader. And as always, don't forget to read slowly, take notes, and apply the ideas. Thank you for listening to the Read Well Podcast.